اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈسٹنگوز ویئرس آئی ویلکم یو آل ٹو یٹ انورا ایپیسوڈ آف دی فوروم وی ہیو ممبرس فرام دی امبو اسمان آف دی گامبیا وی ہیو اگین اور برورا جمکی کمرا جمکی کمرا از دی ڈائریکٹر آف کمیونیکیشنس آف دی امبو اسمان ویلکم جمکی کمرا اینڈ آن ہیز فائر رائڈ وی ہیو Mr. Per Simon Seca. Mr. Per Simon Seca is the Director of Investigations in the Ombudsman. I welcome you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Kamara, <coughs> in our last episode, um, we were talking about um, like visits to the prisons and other centers of detention. Um, my question to you is going to be, um, like, what governance and human rights principles do this visits half. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Bob. I'm not quite sure if my voice will carry me through the program. Okay, fine. But if we look at the issue of um, visits to prisons and detention centers, it reminds us of some very important principles. Why should the ombudsman be interested in people who are already in conflict with the law? This may be a kind of a question somebody would ask, maybe. People who are in detention, they have uh, done something that requires them to be punished. This is not the correct way of seeing things. It is important for us to understand that anybody who is uh, detained is detained on suspicion of having committed an offense or is about or there is reasonable evidence that he's about to commit a crime or an offense, or well, there is a court order that requires him to appear before, before the court. Assuming somebody has committed a crime, he is still presumed innocent. And that's the important, important principle that we always remember. There's always the presumption of innocence until you are proven guilty in a court of competent jurisdiction. And what about if a person is found guilty and is sentenced to a jail term? Then we may see. Therefore, he is already guilty. But even if you are guilty of a crime, you still have rights. You can be deprived of your right to liberty, but you still have uh, rights. And even the notion that we are sending people, send, sentencing people to jail terms is based on punishment. That's not how modern concept of prison uh, has become. It has evolved. For many of us, we should understand how we believe that when we send people to prison, we send them to prison because we want to reform them. We want them to come back, to come out of prison, being better people who can contribute to our development. They come out knowing that they are capable of doing things. But when they come out aggrieved, when they come out, having gone through violations of their rights, mm -hmm. being subjected to inhumane or degrading mm -hmm. treatments. Mm -hmm. It affects their psychology. It affects their self-worth. It affects their, their dignity. Mm -hmm. And they may not be able to contribute to society. And in fact, they may come out feeling a sense of vengeance because society has treated me, society has. So that is why 
when we look at these issues of um, visits to prisons and detention centers, we must look at them in the broader context of governance. That the state has the right or the responsibility to protect and defend the rights of all people, especially people who are vulnerable, who people who are uh, behind the bars. Okay. The issue of um, arresting people must conform with laws. So it reminds us that even when people are arrested, there is no law that says you can arbitrarily arrest. So I already have alluded to some circumstances on which, under which people can be arrested. Okay. But also, even that is controlled in the sense that when you bring somebody, um, when there is suspicion that somebody has committed or about to commit, and there is need for him to appear before the court, that is done within 72 hours. Okay. So when that is violated, then a person's fundamental right is violated. So the state has a responsibility <clears throat> to protect the rights of all persons, to protect the rights of a people, and to ensure that uh, principles of good governance are upheld, not only for people who are out of prison, mm -hmm. who are not under detention, mm -hmm. but also for, for people who are under detention. Mm -hmm. Governance has very important principles of transparency, and accountability. Okay. And when we say transparency in terms of prisons and de detention centers, the visits, whether it is by ombudsman mm -hmm. or by human rights, uh, uh, other human rights institutions uh, or people dealing in that area, working in that area, it is to ensure that it's a whole lot of transparency, openness of the system. There shouldn't be anything. It's not that people, the moment people are under, you know, detention, they are in prison, then they are shocked from society. So they are, whatever happens to them should be secret. Mm -hmm. But openness of process, and so mm -hmm. that there is fairness of process. Mm -hmm. Openness in the sense that when you visit, mm -hmm. like Bondi told us previously, when they go to mm -hmm. places, you know, unannounced, mm -hmm. that, that, that tells people, okay, um, it means I cannot be um, in a position that will, if so anybody should come in, mm -hmm. find people in a manner that will indicate that their rights are very violated. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, a process where mm -hmm. people who were brought to prison, okay. when they are brought, when they are released, that is the, you know, the registers, you know, because we observe all of those things, mm -hmm. or how long they are, this, makes the system more transparent, more transparent. That's right. um, and under which conditions they are kept. Mm -hmm. This makes our system, the prison system, more transparent. And the issue of accountability is that every government institution that is tasked with holding or that is charged, put in charge of uh, people mm -hmm. under detention, they are responsible for those people. Mm -hmm. This is the concept of Accountability. Accountability, first and foremost, starts with knowing who is responsible for what and ensuring that they take responsibility for whatever they are responsible of. And if there is um, violations okay. under them, then you know you can oppose on, you can oppose on blame. Okay. Or wrongdoing can be easily attributed. But also, if there is success, mm -hmm. it means that it is easy to know that, okay, it is Mr. Ba who has helped the state, who has done this, this, done this thing in terms of his TOR, and has, uh, has contributed immensely to, the, to, 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 to uplifting our governance level, our governance scorecard, mm -hmm. to ensuring that the, you know, there is, there is, uh, it, is, it is remarkable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the scoreboard is, 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 is favorable to the country. And that too has its own merits. The other side too, of course, if you have done it, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, so the ombudsman and these issues of visits and so that there is accountability mm -hmm. and there is transparency in the system, in addition to ensuring that the rules 
the laws of the land are upheld for people who are under detention and to ensure that they are kept in, in very in conditions that are in keeping with local standards, with laws above as well as, as well as international standards. Because we don't want to be the people who are behind. We want to also be the people who are leading and ensuring in the defense and protection of the rights of all people. That is brilliant, like the accountability and the, yeah. Um, before I come to Mr. Seka, um, quickly, Mr. Kamara, um, you've been mentioned about the 72 hours detention. Can you please shed some light on that? I think the viewers out there would really want to like, like have more understanding about the, like, like the hours of detention, that is 72 hours. Yes, in section uh, 19 of the constitution, subsection three, uh, it provides for people to be brought before court um, within 72 hours. Why is this so? Because if this is not done, it will constitute detention without trial. There has to be a limit to how long you can keep people. This is in keeping with good uh, uh, principles of uh, human rights, but also of governance, so that you know people's rights are not violated. Now, the 72 hours means that you can take people to court to try them to appear before the court if your detention is going to go beyond 72 hours it will not be determined by the a prison officer or a police officer but by a court of law and if um the the, the 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 constitution provides that if people are unnecessarily kept in the prison or detention centers and they are not brought before a court they should be re released unconditionally or and condition, but all reasonable conditions to enable them to appear uh, before a court of law or to, uh, you know, to appear for uh, preliminary findings uh, in connection uh, with their trial. So I think this is important in the sense that, look, when we visit, we ensure that the rights of a people, fundamental rights of a people, is not violated. If that is done, it means that your fundamental right um, under the Constitution is what is uh, violated. That is very brilliant. Coming to Mr. Seka, uh, Mr. Seka is the investigation guy in the Ombudsman. Um, how can like someone lodge a complaint to the Ombudsman, Mr. Seka, please? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, the Ombudsman office, uh, you can lodge a complaint either by coming to the office. We have a complaints officer there mm -hmm. who will reduce uh, what you have said into writing, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, the matter will fall to the ombudsman, where it will be assessed <coughs> to see whether the case falls within our mandate mm -hmm. or it does not fall within our mandate. Mm -hmm. Or secondly, if you are somebody who is literate, uh, you can write uh, to the officer of the ombudsman, mm -hmm. but when writing, uh, you have to give us your detail address, uh, your telephone number, the nature of the complaint, background of the complaint, the people that you have been interacting with before you lodge the complaint. Because one thing that one, uh, one has to realize is the ombudsman is the last resort. Mm -hmm. Before coming to the ombudsman, we expect that you have exercised all the channels that you are supposed to exhaust within the institution mm -hmm. and the officers that you have been dealing. If nothing works, then you can come to the officer, the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. So also we will want, uh, when you are writing that complaint, you tell us what was the response from those public officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, even if you, uh, whether also you have written to the head of the department, because there are instances whereby the head of the de department is not aware. Mm -hmm. Because if he's aware, he could have uh, solved the problem, uh, solve the problem mm -hmm. uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, even if where you have written to, uh, to him and uh, you didn't have any response or whatever, then you can lodge the complaint to the officer. You can mention that in the your complaint, mm -hmm. and also uh, you all the correspondences that you have been. Um, doing with with that whether the head of institution or the institution or the officer's concern, mm -hmm. you can attach it in the complaint, and you bring it before the officer, the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. And once you bring that complaint, when we receive it, there is what we call assessment of the complaint, okay. because we have to assess the complaint to ensure that it falls within our mandate. Mm -hmm. Because if at, if at all that we have investigated a case which does not fall within our mandate, then uh, we are acting ultra virus beyond our mandate, and that matter if it's taken bef before the court. It, was, it could be squashed by the court, saying that you have acted beyond your mandate. So we'll find out that once it is assessed and it is fo uh, found out that it falls within our mandate, then the ombudsman will give approval mm -hmm. for the investigation to be commenced. 
So these are the ways that uh, you, uh, one can, listen. even we have a website right now, which I think one can uh, lodge his complaint online. Mm -hmm. And there is a form uh, which states, give, give you a guideline as to how to go about it. So in, uh, initially also you, you can use telephone, mm -hmm. but for us we prefer more if you come in person or you write. But there's also nothing wrong using the telephone to call us and to talk to us about your complaint. But most of the time, the practice at the office is either you come on passing, in passing, or you write, uh, send us the listing, and we can uh, look into the complaint. That is very brilliant, yeah. Mr. Seka. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned, um, like, if someone has a complaint, you can come and lodge the complaint, mm -hmm. you know, then, you know, you can see the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, my next question to you is going to be, like, are there any formal steps that you have with Amusman mm -hmm. that are involved in how someone can lodge a complaint? Yeah, normally, uh, just as I've said initially, there are two ways. You either come to the office mm -hmm. or you write on your own with the details that I've just explained mm -hmm. uh, and you uh, brought it to the Ombudsman. Mm -hmm. So once we receive those complaints uh, and uh, we found out that it is within our mandate, then what we do is uh, we'll explain to you what you expect from us. Because the Ombudsman is all about transparency, accountability, and probity. So we, uh, we are saying, and transparency. So we are saying that uh, once the complaint is lodged uh, to us, the first thing that we'll do is we will explain to you uh, what is expected of us, how long the investigation will take, mm -hmm. you see. And also we'll tell you that, okay, one of the principles of uh, investigation is impartiality, that we have an open mind. We don't side with either the administration or with you. We are neutral. We are an umpire in the middle. We just investigate because investigation is fact-finding. Mm -hmm. And based on those uh, facts that we gathered and also the laws that are involved in that particular case and also the witnesses that we have interviewed will determine our recommendations because one of the uh, principles of Ombudsman is offering redress. Mm -hmm. Once we have found, uh, made our investigation and also uh, come across, uh, found out that, okay, you have been unfairly treated or whatever, mm -hmm. and looking at all the relevant laws, we made a recommendation for that uh, person, uh, for that uh, institution to implement the recommend uh, our recommend recommendations of the office. There are other steps that we have to take, mm -hmm. but I think uh, as time goes on, mm -hmm. I will explain to you uh, those areas. Yeah, we will come to that, Mr. Seka. Yeah. Um, but before you come to that, I will come back to Mr. Kamara. Mr. Kamara, um, there are various issues you know, that can give rise to complaints. But I want us to talk about one word in specific, that is like appointment. Or in other words, you know, in other companies, they may say recruitment. Um, like, are the processes of uh, recruitment like big complaints in the Ombudsman? Yeah, thank you. Um, the issue of appointment or recruitment is one area that can give rise to complaints. The anytime we will hear a complaint, it is either the that is was uh, that is the uh, public sector complaint that is emanating within the public sector itself. Um, that is complainant, both complainant and com I mean the one complaint agents being uh, public officers. Sometimes you go up to the level of uh, retirement, a complaint that uh, emanates is as a result of something that is linked to your appointment. So the appointment process, all along, you find complaints coming, um, grievances that are as a result of the process of recruitment. The, Acts of maladministration or wrongdoing is two-way traffic. Sometimes it is the employer, but sometimes it is the employee. Now, looking at the appointment or recruitment process, what specific issues are there mm -hmm. that may give rise to complaints? You see, the moment there is a vacancy, 
what we hear is that there's an advertisement, right? From suitably qualified, for example, from suitably qualified Gambians. And when we hear this word, suitably qualified Gambians, you expect people to apply for these vacancies or these jobs or post positions. And since it says suitably qualified Gambians, then the word Gambian, mm -hmm. it means you have to be Gambian to apply. Mm -hmm. It can give rise to somebody forging his nationality to say that he is Gambian when he's not Gambian. That means to obtain a Gambian ID card or to obtain a Gambian birth certificate and to seek to be employed in the Gambia public service. When we say uh, suitably qualified Gambians, the suitability there brings a whole lot of issues that can always, that can reflect and be the subject of grievances or complaints or problems within public institutions. Mm -hmm. For example, somebody who is seeking employment, he knows there is a, an age limit, for example. Um, even this is contested by people that, you know, you don't discriminate based on the age, but then you do find it. Mm -hmm. So somebody reduces his age and he gets, he forged mm -hmm. birth certificates or ID cards to say he is, just to prove that he, he is entitled to apply for that job. Then, age is one thing. And you know what? Later on, we have received complaints mm -hmm. relating to this issue of age. Somebody saying that, they say he is grad, he's, uh, due for retirement, but he's not due for retirement because he's not 60 years. Because he has increased maybe his age to benefit other things. And that comes back to haunt him. And the other area of forgery in relation to appointment processes. Still, I'm talking about employees. Mm -hmm. Sometimes an employee, knowing that the qualification for this post is a bachelor's degree, or master's degree, or a diploma, he can forge. Um, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. Um, people even in the world, you know, do you hear that somebody claim to have a PhD, but he doesn't have a PhD. So all of these things, you know, they arise along the way. Somebody's challenging somebody that he doesn't have a PhD. Or an employer is challenging somebody that, you know, um, he, he's not qualified uh, to teach or to, um, to be employed because what he claimed to have, he never heard that. In fact, I recall when I was going to school, my uh, first IRK teacher at high school, he was somebody who was a non-Muslim, and he never read Islamic studies. But he presented papers to the school authorities, and he was employed as our IRK teacher, and he was teaching a shark. If you tell a Muslim shark, the Muslim say, what is shark, what is shark? For him, he does not know what is shark. He knows shark, but he doesn't know shirk. <laughs> so what I'm saying is like, he's fired. But just like in his case, mm -hmm. employers do, and you know what? It is gross misconduct to provide false information in the employment process. Mm -hmm. To say you have a degree when you do not have. To say you, uh, you have this age when you do not have. And sometimes these are the issues, you know, relating to the side of the employees that will register complaints relating to conducts or things that they have done during the time of, their, uh, of the recruitment, recruitment process. Then you have the employer. The employer, several things can happen along the way. You have people who employ people verbally, verbally. You are employed. They have done things 
uh, that also later on develops into other problems. But even at that process itself, form of the complaints that we register is that I do not have an appointment later. It is not in keeping with good administrative practice that you appoint somebody verbally. They do this. Some of the employers do this knowingly. Knowing that once you are employed verbally, then you can be dismissed verbally. And also, because a formal process of appointment, a formal process of appointment will require that you have a, a person's title, his status, his pensionable uh, permanent appointment. Um, you have an exit clause that he has a right to also leave or he can also be fired or removed upon giving one month's notice. His starting point, the great the salary, is there. So, if no officing, if there is no position for you um, formally, how do you know where your terms of reference fall under? Fall under? Mm -hmm. So they can abuse you. So you all you know is that I am an employee, but you can they can task you for anything and to any degree. If there is no statement of the starting point of your grade, then they can pay you anything. And you wouldn't also know how you are rising through the, I mean, payment ladder. Because there's no starting point. All of these are supposed to be included in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the appointment letter. If you uh, do not have uh, an exit clause, and it is known from the beginning that you can, he is, you can remove uh, him from or terminate his service. The wise reason, of course, that's just cause. But upon giving a month's notice, if that is not there, it means that he has no, he can be there for just a day and then he is told, okay, one day, please go home, you're not, your service is not service no needed. So a lot of times the problems that we have, we handle, Relating to, but even that, um, an employee too can just come. And you know what? Sometimes we, uh, you dig a hole for somebody to fall in. And uh, you might be the one to fall in that hole, right? An employee too can just get up one day and say, I'm going to have a job. <laughs> I'm going to have a job. He does not know he is supposed to give a month's notice. You probably did not tell him because you think that would be to your advantage. But here you are faced with a scenario. Somebody is living. He just gets up one day and he says he has a job. He's going. You have helped to make him ignorant of the rules of uh, employment. When to leave, how to leave, under what circumstances. You have contributed to his low level of understanding about the process, you, you thought or you think you are doing that because it's going to serve your interest and it comes back to haunt you. Even the process of um, advertising, um, um, employing, recruiting people, that's why the Ombudsman even Act states the process of recruitment in the security services to have a balanced structuring or not to have discrimination in the in the in the in the in the recruitment uh, process, the reason the Ombudsman Act provides for this is that it means there's a possibility of uh, some kind of favoritism. Okay. The employer too can give the job to the least qualified person. That too will be violating mm -hmm. the um, terms of. Uh, Principles of good governance, I mean like good administration, because everybody stand a chance to get employed. But when you get the least qualified and ignore the most qualified or the most competent and give it to the least competent, you have not only violated or abused your office, 
by misapplying your powers. Um, you have not only denied somebody what is entitled, but you have also contributed to um, creating a mediocre system, a system that does not value merit. You have contributed to a system that if you appoint people who are incompetent, you cannot give what you do not have. You appoint people who are incompetent, then they will not be able to execute the demands of the post for which they have been appointed. appointed. So the violations of conditions can arise, um, can, 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 uh, can happen. Um, <clears throat> conditions of fairness, of, uh, of openness, and ensure that, you know, um, it is advertised that it needs to be advertised. Um, there is no, 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 there is no need for head hunting. There shouldn't be any need for head hunting. If there is need for only governments to be qualified, I mean, there is need for qualified governments to be applied uh, to be appointed to a post. Why do you want to bring some people outside? So, somewhat, a lot of times you can have also complaints relating to the process itself, the process itself that it is not fair, that it is not just, that you know, um, it did not follow. Uh, Expected standards of recruitment and all of those things are areas. Um, I'm just summarizing, right. but every stage of the issues that we are talking about, and we're going to talk about, they are also broad. That at every stage, issues can arise that will give rise to complaint during the process or later on in the in the life of a public officer. Certain complaints can emerge, or the employer can emerge as a result of the process of appointment or the process of recruitment. I think that point has been um, dealt with excellently. Um, going back to Mr. Seka, um, I want to put this question to you like this. Um, what are the steps that are involved in, in investigation in Ombudsman? Yeah, the steps that are involved after approval has been given by the Ombudsman for a case to be investigated, uh, the officer, depending on the complex city of the case, because there are cases that you know, after looking at it, them you will you will just go to the you will use the mediation approach, approach go to the institutional concern, and you can solve it within a day or within a week. Mm -hmm. If the case is a complex case, then what you do is uh, you assign to an investigator, and the what the investigator has to do first is to look at the relevant laws that are, are uh, that are. Uh, relevant to that particular case, and also look at uh, the issues that has been raised in the complaint. Sometimes it could be one issue or two or three, depending on the number of issues that are in the complaint. Mm -hmm. Then after th that is done, you look at uh, the witnesses that you are going to interview. Mm -hmm. Because those witnesses also, you have to prioritize them. And also you have to look at the documents, uh, evidence, uh, which you know also can support uh, the uh, this thing, the investigation process, mm -hmm. and once you have got all these four uh, steps that I have explained, then you will analyze. And once you have analyzed the uh, investigation, because investigation investigation is all about fact finding, uh, you, and once you analyze, then you come to a conclusion and write a preliminary report, mm -hmm. and that preliminary report will be taken before the ombudsman and deputies for them to look at. Uh, before coming up with a final uh, recommendation on the matter. Mm -hmm. So where the Ombudsman has made a recommendation, uh, the institution that is concerned, we give them almost about sometimes two weeks or one week to see whether they will uh, implement our recommendations mm -hmm. or they will, not uh, uh, they, they will not implement. So in the event where they have failed to implement our recommendations, mm -hmm. we'll call them to show cause why they have failed to implement our recommendations. Okay. And if they are able to give genuine reason mm -hmm. and bring new evidence, we will review our investigation and this thing, and then we'll come up with a different, if that, if at all they have convinced the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. But in the event where they have failed to convince the ombudsman, what the ombudsman will do is, the ombudsman will ask them to uh, give out an order mm -hmm. to implement their recommendation within a particular period, failing which, the matter will be referred to His Excellency the President, President. who has a final say on the matter. Mm -hmm. And whatever recomm uh, recommendation the audition the President has taken, we will communicate back uh, to the uh, complainant mm -hmm. or to the institution 
that uh, this uh, is what has happened. So we have few instances mm -hmm. where ha we have uh, referred the matter to his Excellency the President, mm -hmm. and uh, the outcome we are favorable in uh, uh, as far as the Ombudsman is concerned. Okay. We, the, the inso those uh, instances were asked to implement the recommendation of the Ombudsman, and they adhere to uh, the recommendations of the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman. So this is uh, these are the steps that are so far involved as far as uh, case, uh, when we start investigation, mm -hmm. one, we ensure that it's within the mandate of the Ombudsman. Mm -hmm. Two, we make sure that we are not acting uh, ultra virus. And the third one, the steps that are involved, we explain it because we have to be uh, transparent to the uh, complaint to know what he is going to expect from us mm -hmm. at the end of the day once we have uh, completed the investigation. Yeah. Mr. Seka, what what um like what are the powers of the ombudsman? Yeah, the powers of the ombudsman. Yeah, normally in our uh, what we do in practice, what we do is, uh, if we feel that a particular head of institution should be invite uh, should come to the office of the ombudsman, we will invite you, for you to come to the ombudsman mm -hmm. so that we can sit down and discuss the matter and find a solution. Mm -hmm. But in the event. Where we have invited you and you refuse to come, the Ombudsman has the power to summons. And that summons has the same force uh, as uh, a summons issued by the High Court. So once you are summons and you have failed to report to the officer of the Ombudsman, then the Ombudsman can issue a warrant. And that warrant will be given to the police to force your appearance. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the powers of the Ombudsman. Uh, issuing warrant to force complainants who have failed to uh, come to the uh, to uh, response to the invitation of the ombudsman, you can uh, be forced. Uh, forced. The second one is uh, the ombudsman has powers during the course of his investigation to enter any building at any time and have access to any document that is in in connection with the case that they are investigating. Okay. They have the powers also to look at any case that has brought, been brought uh, to them and they, they determine the case and make a recommendation. So uh, they also uh, have the powers uh, to extract from any documents, the, like it could be a voucher, it could be a cash book or whatever, but any material that is relevant to, their, uh, to its investigation. The Ombudsman has the power to make sure that those uh, uh, access to those powers. Except where the matter is uh, under the classified information, mm -hmm. then there is a push uh, portion where we says that, okay, we need a certificate from His Excellency to say whether that uh, document should be released or not. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, any document that we feel that is relevant to the, uh, our investigation, we have the mandate uh, to lay hands on those documents as far as this thing. And what we normally do is we issue our summons to produce documents. Mm -hmm. And once we issue those documents and we list the number of documents that we want to have access to, uh, most, uh, you, we uh, will come to your institution and you will make sure that those things are available mm -hmm. to us. So That's these are the powers. The first power is uh, to arrest. The mm -hmm. second one is to have access to documents that is relevant to its investigation. Wow. Yeah. That is the like office of the ombudsman have powers huh? yeah, <laughs> back to mr mr kamara mr kamara um i just want to ask you one question quickly um are there like any issues like of salary and like like allowances can it bring like grievance i think uh, we have received a lot of uh, so sometimes you would say salary and uh, allowance issues from you know top the um, mm -hmm. um, issues of complaints um, and talking about salary um, there are various aspects of salary that can uh, give rise or to complaints mm -hmm. the the we were talking about appointment mm -hmm. and then i mentioned that somebody uh, may be appointed and there is no indication of where you know his starting point is great mm -hmm. you know salary got great that can bring rise uh, give rise to uh, issues of uh, grievances in the sense that they will complain to say that they are underpaid mm -hmm. 
And it is the right of a, an employee to be paid and to be paid uh, the right salary. So anytime an employer underpays an employee, this gives rise to complaints. Mm -hmm. But not only paid your salary, another issue is you should be paid your salary on time. On time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will complain that they are, they have, uh, there's delay in the payment of their salary. But that's just one thing. Mm -hmm. There's also usually complaints about not paid your salary. You know, um, this is like my previous point and this one I call, they are linked. The, the process of recruitment, sometimes you know what happens. You appoint somebody two months, three months, he's not paid. Why? The documentation process is not concluded. We are working on finalizing. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, making some administrative arrangements for the payment of his salary. So you see, failure to pay salary. In fact, that is the major cause of um, grievances. Mm -hmm. I mean, late payment of salary. Underpayment, that is like um, I think I'm, I'm entitled to more than that. Or okay. people thinking that because, because of the lack of transparency in this, not lack, but instances of uh, processes not being transparent do happen mm -hmm. to the point that employees will think that that's, they, are, they are receiving less. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you say allowances, in fact, that's the, that's the, so much complaints have emerged over the years, you know, at the Ombudsman office relating to issues of allowances. And allowances can be just whatever you're entitled to as part of your salary. You know, your salary is your basic and your allowances. Of course, salary is, you know, basic, but then, you know, what you're paid, you know, your, your net pay is not just your basic salary, it's your basic salary and your allowances. Mm -hmm. Somebody can own a car, and he is entitled to, to a car allowance. Mm -hmm. And he's running his car, and he's not paid his car allowance. That's right. Um, you've made um, mention of a very interesting point, um, that is most of the grievance um, is caused by like salary. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about um, like promotion. Can promotion also lead to like grievance? Do the ombudsman also like receive complaints about promotion that can give rise to like grievance? Of course. When it comes to uh, promotion, this is another area. In the sense that you find people who will be will work for many years at the same salary, um, at the same level of payment. When I say promotion here, maybe your your the, the your substantively mm -hmm. rising from one level of position to another level of position, but also of course um, realizing changes. Sometimes even if you are the same uh, salary, but realizing changes mm -hmm. in your in your take home. But now let's look at let's look at the issue of uh, um, the of understanding of promotion, of course. Moving from one person to another person. Mm -hmm. um, some services are structured in a way that people will move, perform, be appointed. They will, uh, maybe, your, for, example, for example, the security, maybe your first class or your uh, lance corporal or whatever. And of course, with your performance and good conduct, you can be there for, for example, you're there for many years and others are just rising. Then you, you will be aggrieved, right? You're aggrieved. So you do have uh, complaints because people feel that their colleagues, oh, these people that I'm appointed with. Um, uh, and of course, we're all performing. And uh, there is nothing adverse 
in my uh, file. Uh, there has not been any uh, findings against me of uh, incompetence or, or committing actions that are contrary to my, uh, to, 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 you know, the expectations of my boss, which may contribute to my, uh, you know, me not being promoted. So the local people rising, they do raise complaints about that and say, okay, they're also equally entitled. And sometimes, um, there are, what complaints that you have about promotion is that you have a, a vacant position and somebody acts in that position and he performs the functions of that position. And he has every qualification uh, and his performance too. This is an additional indication that he has, uh, is capable of handling and then you give it to a less qualified person, he will be aggrieved. That can cause grievances. They can cause grievances. Yes, yes, yeah. can cause grievances. Yeah. So, so, you, so, so um, time is against us. Um, um, but back to Mr. Sega, just finally, um, like after all the investigations and all those things, um, what can a Muslim do? Yeah, just as I explained, where we have completed investigation, we expect the, uh, the instrument that uh, is complained against to implement recommendation of the ombudsman mm -hmm. because of the key goal of uh, the ombudsman is offering remedies either uh, restoring the person to the position that he would have been had the uh, maladministration or unfair trade occurred or where that is not possible then that individual should be compensated adequately mm -hmm. so these are the two areas that you know when we investigate and make recommendations uh, against a particular institution, we expect you to implement our recommendations. And in most cases, uh, just as I said, it's only a few instances that we have the uh, opportunity to uh, refer the matter to His Excellency. But we use our persuasive skills because of that is also part of the Ombudsman strategy. Investigation is all about fact finding. If an investigation is thoroughly done and all the facts are lying on the table, then it could be very easy for you to convince that head of department mm -hmm. that, okay, look, these are the facts and they are backed by evidence. This person should be uh, promoted or this person is entitled to longevity. Just as Juma was saying, mm -hmm. we have so many cases of that nature whereby somebody will be in a particular position for almost about 10, 15 years. Uh, he's not promoted. But the general order is saying that whereby somebody is uh, promoted and he has jammed the uh, great uh, uh, grade level, grade point of eight. Mm -hmm. After two years, he's el eligible to be promoted. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, for one reason or the especially where you are uh, uh, posted in the provinces, uh, you find it difficult or sometimes even uh, it may escape uh, the authorities, the administrative authorities. So you, they will just dump you there. Nothing is happening when you are due for longevity because you are not promoted, you are not paid, and then that also make you not to be uh, productive because of, you say, oh, I'm just stagnant for almost about 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. I'm not promoted. So this job came on, let me just do what I, uh, this thing. So you'll find out that when such things happen, uh, we will get into the, uh, the bottom, uh, bottom of it and then recommend. And recently, we find out that everything has been computerized with the personal management office, whereby when somebody is uh, due for longevity, it will just flag. So right now, I learned that it's automatic. But initially, mm -hmm. we have been having a lot of that in the uh, province, or whereby somebody will die, and the, he's supposed to pay dead gratuity. The family will not know. Mm -hmm. So these things, when Juma and others go on a sensitization, it will come out and we will follow the matter with the Department of uh, Treasury or other institutions that are concerned until they are paid. Yeah. Okay. So just in a nutshell, uh, once uh, we implement our recommendation, uh, we expect public institutions to uh, adhere to our recommendations and they have been doing very well. The working relations at least is cordial because of yeah, the facts are there. Once the facts are there, it's very difficult for one to say, I'm not going to, except if you are recalcitrant. And if you are recalcitrant, we refer the matter to His Excellency, uh, the President. Of the Republic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Seka, and thank you, Mr. Kamara. Um, dear viewers, this is all time, time has allowed us. Um, until our next episode of the forum, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.